So they were starting to talk about Emerson. Um, I guess I'll follow my usual practice of writing his dates and actually to remind you where we are, I'm going to write the other ones too. So, um, so I, I mean, the dates here are alive, maybe they're not the most relevant dates because. Especially because Schelling lived so long that you know he actually died after Coleridge and was born before him. But uh, but remember the system transcendental idealism that we read was published in 1800, and the aids to reflection. Uh, 1820. The first edition was 1825. Um, so in that sense, Coleridge is after uh, Schelling. And now we've moved on to Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. The dates are 18 and 5 to 18. 82. So, um, you know, significantly younger. And the essay's first series. Now, actually, I don't know if. I don't know if any of these were published independently before the collection was. I don't think so. But anyway, so, because it really is kind of one book. But so essays first series was published in 1841. So self-reliance but read today was essays first series, 1841. Um, so we are moving through the 19th century. <laughs> um, um, and also, as usual, I don't have that much to say about Emerson's biography, you know. I mean, uh, I guess uh, Maybe the important thing to know about him is that he was a Unitarian minister, but he moved away from the Unitarian church, moved away from any organized church. Um, so, I mean, Unitarian is already, like I didn't talk about this, but you've noticed in Aids to Reflection, Coleridge has a long footnote about why Unitarianism is not Christianity. <laughs> So uh, Unitarian is, is already, uh, from Coleridge's point of view, pretty far out. But but for Emerson and the other transcendentalists, it was like the conservative establishment compared to what they wanted to do. Um, so, um, so in that way, he's quite different from Coleridge. Um, but in other ways, he's similar. And I guess part of the issue is to put your finger on the difference. Um, okay, so I mean, it's difficult to, I think the first time I lectured about Emerson before I did it, I was like, how is this even going to be possible? <laughs> it's, I mean, you certainly can't, I certainly can't, well, I could, I guess, but I shouldn't do what I would do with Schelling or Coleridge, which is to um, try to build up a doctrine or let alone an argument using all the pieces from an essay like this, kind of like rearrange them into an argument or a doctrine and try to like fill in the blanks and reconcile apparent contradictions and so forth. Um, it's that's just not going to be a good idea. And Emerson himself says why this is one of the famous. There's a lot of famous quotes from this essay <laughs> and from other of Emerson's other writings, but uh, uh, but this is one of the most famous. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. 
with consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. <laughs> right? So, um, so presumably, if you tried to rearrange it to sound like it was written following a method, in order to be consistent, you would misunderstand it. Now, I mean, Emerson also says at the bottom of the same page, is it so bad then to be misunderstood? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it ends up concluding to be great is to be misunderstood. So, uh, you know, um, Emerson, uh, in a sense, wouldn't care if I misunderstood him. But, um, um, That doesn't mean he wouldn't care if I understood him. <laughs> it means he wouldn't care if I misunderstood him. Um, meaning, uh, this text is designed to leave some people out. Right? I think that's what I don't care if I misunderstood him means some people are going to read this and not understand it and thereby become not part of my audience. Um, that's, you know, so there's a very similar issue in Nietzsche. It's not a coincidence that Emerson, that Nietzsche thought Emerson was so great. There's a very similar issue in Nietzsche and um, we'll talk about that when we get to Nietzsche. Um, so, I mean, um, because uh, obviously he's talking to someone. <laughs> uh, he's, and, and the someone he's talking to, if they exist, are going to have to understand. Them. Okay, so that. Uh, um, that's both a statement of why it's difficult to talk about this and at the same time beginning to talk about it. And I, I mean, that's the only, like there's no, um, there's no simple way into it. <laughs> so, um, so, but uh, I, having said that, now let me make a new start and say, well, okay, how different is that from Shelling really? That he says, he doesn't mind if he's misunderstood, and we shouldn't expect him to be consistent. I mean, Schelling is also full of contradictions, and Schelling also says that most people won't be able to understand him, right? They lack the organ or something like that. So um, uh, I think there is a difference. I think there's an important difference, and it has something to do with how the contradictions that occur in the work can be solved. <laughs> so um, this is what Emerson says on the next page, um, page 59 at the bottom. There will be an agreement in whatever variety of actions, so they be each honest and natural in their hour. For of one will, the actions will be harmonious, however unlike they seem. Meaning, I mean, at that point, he's, he's seemingly giving you advice on how to act, right? Don't let consistency hold you back. Um, but I think at the same time, it's information about how he writes, right? It's, um, um, what Schelling does with a contradiction is try to resolve it. Right? He bends his will to the resolution of this contradiction and says, I can't go on unless I resolve it. What Emerson does with the contradiction is say, um, um, I rely on myself to contain a principle 
from which this apparent inconsistency consistently follows. Right? So self-reliance is self-trust. Um, that's what the essay is about, and that's also what the essay is like an example of, or at least what Emerson wants it to be an example of. So, um, um, so the, the philosophical instruction, which we expect to be know thyself, gets changed into, on page 49, trust thyself. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron strength. <laughs> so what that means in terms of reading Emerson, if that's the way he's writing, is that if we trust Emerson, then we should agree with him that there's some unity here. But we shouldn't try to detect him trying to ensure that unity the way Schelling would. Right? Because we shouldn't try to figure out what move he's making. That's the way people talk about it now. Um, and, um, you know, to some philosophers, it seems appropriate, but Emerson is telling us that at least if he turns out to be trustworthy, he's not making a move. <laughs> he's doing what he must. And um, uh, as far as the result goes, he's in the same situation we are. He has to trust that, that, that something consistent is coming out. Um, so, uh, so, right, so that's another way to, to, to get into how is Emerson related to what we read already and um, what shouldn't, what do I not want to try to do in time? <laughs> so what should I do instead? Well, um, um, I think the other part of that, like, okay, how is this different from Schelling? You know, I mean, for me, like, I don't know if Emerson would like this either. I mean, this is my strategy. I don't know what Emerson would say about it. For me, like, when, uh, when it seems inadvisable to like directly approach the question of what a certain philosopher means. A lot of times the way I'll approach it is say, well, how are they related to someone else? <laughs> um, and in this case, obviously there's a, there's a, um, of course it's been set up to provide a framework to ask that question. <laughs> Um, about Emerson and also about Nietzsche. And so the question could be, first of all, like, um, how do we even know that Emerson is talking about the same things that Schelling and Coleridge are talking about? That the subject hasn't changed entirely. And um, if he is talking about the same things, then where is he rejecting them? Um, Yeah, like I said, I'm not sure what Emerson would say about that. It's especially hard. I mean, so again, if we were talking about Schelling and I wanted to figure out what Schelling would say about something, I would, again, try to figure out, fill, fill out his position and figure out what move he would make in response to a certain question. Um, but again, with Emerson, it's trickier than that. But uh, I mean, I have to imagine how he could say it in his language, sort of, to see whether he would say it. Like, um, uh, to understand the unity of this essay, understand what things have been excluded in order to achieve it. I think he would say something like that, at least sometimes. <laughs> so anyway, so um, that's that's the basic question. And um, of course, sometimes it seems clear that that Emerson is talking about the same things that Coleridge and 
uh, Schelling are talking about when he starts talking about God and the soul and the aboriginal self. Um, um, uh, this is on page 20. Here's a place where he sounds like he's, if you only read this one thing, you might think you were reading a quote from Schelling almost. Uh, um, wait, it's not page 20. Page 20 is not even. I have pages in two different paginations. Yeah, it's page 64. Who is the trustee? What is the aboriginal self on which a universal reliance may be grounded? What is the nature and power of that science baffling star without parallax? Without parallax means that it doesn't move its apparent position against the background. And it moves one side to another. <laughs> right? So, like, you know, when the Earth moves from one end of its orbit to another, the star is not too far away. And it will seem to change its position against the background stars as we move from one place to another. That's how you can tell how far it is. So the self is without parallax means it's at an incalculable distance because there's no perspective on it or something like that. But okay, anyway, um, uh, the inquiry leads us to that source at once the essence of genius, of virtue, and of life, which we call spontaneity or instinct. We denote this primary wisdom as intuition. While all later teachings are tuitions. In that deep force, the last fact behind which analysis cannot go, all things find their common origin. Right? So that's all like shelling terminology, basically, except for that thing about parallel that I have to explain. It's all like shelling terminology, and it sounds like something shelling could have written. On the other hand, at other times, it can start to seem like the only connection that we have consists of certain words. Um, and, um, and if I talk about that, it's going to be some introduction to how Emerson, the kind of care with which Emerson texts need to be read. I'm not actually very good at it, <laughs> but I'm trying my best. So like, if you take the word original, so, you know, in that passage that I just read where it ends, all things find their common origin. So, you know, it's easy to say, oh, that's like Schelling's use of the word origin. Um, but how about when you read the first sentence of the essay? So it says, um, I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter which were original and not conventional. Right, so that does not sound, um, I mean, I guess you hear it now because I built it up, right? <laughs> you hear the origin there, but it doesn't sound, if you just read that out of context, like you're talking about transcendental philosophy. Hey, I read some, you know, poetry written by some painter, and it was good because it was like original, <laughs> right? So, um, but if you look into that sentence more, you can see. First of all, that what's opposed to original in that sentence is conventional. So conventional means like coming together. Um, what is coming together with what? Well, um, um, suppose I were to say, that um, the finite activity of the self is coming together with the apparently alien influence. Um, that 
right? So the original is opposite to conventional because conventional means like um, adaptive, right? Remember, Coleridge said that understanding is the adaptive faculty, right? It's the faculty that like tries to meet the stimulus from outside and um, and and actively represent it, something like that. Um, instead of adaptive, you might say performing. Um, right, that, you know, um, um, when Shelley talks about how the act of knowledge must uh, Fit or uh, I forget what the translation we had was coincide I think with its object, but you know Uber Einstein Uber Einstein really needs like to agree to uh, to harmonize up together with something like that. Um, it could also be translated as to conform to conform with its object. Um, I think. That's the way you would translate it if you saw it in prompt. You know, but the act of the understanding must conform to its object. <laughs> um, right? Because the understanding is the faculty of the form. And it's con form because it applies its form to, to alien matter and conforms to it. So, um, So whereas self-reliance is, and this is on page 51, and I'm sorry, I, I have to keep using my version on here because I, I tried to print it out, but the, the machine broke. <laughs> it kept like, you know, making me open the paper feed again or whatever. So, yeah. um, um, uh, talking about society in context, but let me read this out of context. The virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. So the you know self-reliance is the aversion of this convention or conformation or adaptation. Uh, it's it's aversion. Aversion means like turning away. Right? Rather than meet this, it turns away. It averts. Oh, is that visible? No. I just see it. Okay. I'm sorry. This is pretty. Uh, I can't even see what is blocked because I have because my display is now blocked by the PDF here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so um, aversion, right? That is what Emerson is saying uh, would be original in this case. It would be the opposite of convention is aversion. And then if you look in a version, you see, um, I read the other day some verses <laughs> written by an eminent painter, <laughs> which were original, right? These were the right kind of verses because they were aversive verses. <laughs> I think that's what he's saying. And then if you ask, like, who is the eminent painter? So, I mean, I asked this on Facebook last time I taught the class. Does anyone know which eminent painter he's talking about? And I got some suggestions and I never really looked into them. So, I mean, like, it, it could very well be that, that there's some particular well known painter who wrote poetry who he's thinking about here. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily 
No, I was going to say not necessarily inconsistent, but it's okay if it's inconsistent, right? But anyway, possibly going along with that would be that, you know, eminence. So, like, eminent means high. That's what it literally means, right? Um, but it's, you know, it's connected with the idea of eminent being, like a higher mode of being. Like in, in Descartes' third meditation, he keeps talking about formal being, objective being, and eminent being. Um, I mean, I could go a lot into what that, that technically means, but just here you might think that the eminent painter is the imagination. That right, the high, the eminent imagination, like the imagination that has a higher mode of being than the world. That paints the world. Um, and the other day, the other day, like how many days are there? So, I mean, the other day, of course, means, you know, whatever it exactly means in English recently, something like that. Who knows why it means that? Um, but um just as you know who knows why or whether i didn't have time to look this up but whether etymologically speaking verse actually this actually does contain verse or not <laughs> um but uh but you know uh but if you just read what it says rather than thinking about what it's supposed to mean it, it sounds like there's an alternative day Right? There's like the conventional day. And then there's the higher day. The other day, I read, I don't know if you read it. <laughs> the other day, I read some verses by an eminent painter, which were original and not conventional. <laughs> now, like, um, You can start to see why the essay might the line begin with that sentence. So I mean, but but it's first of all, it's you have to trust him. You have to trust that there could be something like that going on in this text. If someone else had written this and not Emerson, I would never think to do this. <laughs> right? It's because I trust Emerson. <laughs> um, uh, and um, and if you if you don't trust him and you don't see this kind of thing going on, then the sentence will just slip past you. Right? Like if you read a sentence of showering. And you don't understand what he's talking about. The one thing you're sure of is they don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> right? you know, like, I don't know what he means, but I'm sure I don't understand him. <laughs> right? So, but if you read a sentence of Emerson, most of the time, again, there's exceptions where it kind of surfaces and all of a sudden you realize he's talking metaphysics, right? But most of the time, you read a sentence of Emerson. Um, it will allow you to feel like you understand it and go on to the next sentence. And the only problem will be after you get to the end of the essay, you will have read a whole bunch of sentences that you feel like you understood, but you won't be able to say what you said. <laughs> because why? Because you haven't gotten close to the principle that produced that sequence of sentences because you didn't trust him. Um, or because he wasn't really trustworthy. <laughs> so, um, um, so again, I guess this is like a more detailed look into how he does this exactly. And he relies on the nature of English to do this, I think. Um, it's, um, um, Like, 
I don't remember, did I talk about this in this course before, about the difference between German and English or anything like that? So like, I mean, Heidegger will also will do stuff kind of like this in German. But I mean, we already saw an example of Schelling doing something kind of like this before talking, right? Where he says, well, it actually says original division. It, I mean, it doesn't tell you, he just starts using it that way. You're supposed to, but I mean, by the way, I did look up this etymology and it's, it's wrong, tile. Tile is a cognate of the English word deal. Um, like tiling, among other things, could mean like to divide out, like to distribute. And the, the reason word tile, which by the way also has an English cognate or deal, is an English, English cognate of, oh, sorry, one last I can see it. <sighs> <laughs> right ordeal i guess originally referred to you know now we talk about trial by ordeal i guess that's actually like redundant that ordeal actually meant the judgment of the trial <laughs> right so but they both meant that because they because like to to deal meant uh, like um like fairly distribute things, <laughs> right? So, so ortile actually means like to deal out. It doesn't actually mean original division. But okay. Um, uh, nevertheless, the thing is that when Schelling, um, without bothering with the real etymology, starts using the fact that this at least looks like it means original division, a German reader can't not notice it. Right, it's it's on the surface that this word has that structure. Um, whereas in English, um, there's a few words like this, right? That you know, Coleridge and other English-speaking philosophers like to use, like understand, right? They say, oh, you know, there's a stand and there's an under, and try to use that for something. Coleridge did use that in the reading, I think, but they're not very many. This kind of old Indo-European like um, prefix system is not really being used actively in English, and moreover, we have these Latinate loan words through French that we use most of the time for anything fancy, <laughs> and we don't even hear the way they break into parts a lot of times. When we, you know, when we say them, but we don't see it when we read them. Like the fact that convention has coming together is like you have to point that out <laughs> um so so emerson is relying on that feature of english to do his um to do his thing where he writes so that everyone can read it but um but it tests you to see if you're worthy of understanding it, basically. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so that's just about that one sentence. Obviously, you cannot go through the entire essay and do that with every sentence. <laughs> I mean, not, not only because there's limit, limited time here, but because I have limited time and ability to figure it out, right? Like, I don't, you know, I had to think about this sentence for a long time to see all the things I put up here. I'm probably still missing something. <laughs> right? So, um, um, but, uh, but, sorry. there are things like that everywhere. Um, and the more you can notice, the better, basically. So, um, um, all right, but stepping back from that, so that, that was all a continuation of saying sometimes it seems like there's nothing but the word to hang on to, you know, and I guess like kind of the advice here is that um, if it seems like there's nothing but the word and it's just occurring there accidentally or whatever, look harder and see <laughs> if there's a way that the rest of the context is actually also talking about that. 
Um, but anyway, I mean, uh, from other places, not from that one sentence, it's clear enough that when uh, Emerson talks about origin or what's original, he is still thinking about this. I guess I could definitely erase these. Everyone can see what I draw up here. He is still thinking about this same picture I keep drawing, right? That um, that there's an original unity and an initial separation and somehow this separation is our problem so to speak. Yeah, trip up there. Um, so for example he says on page 50 um, that Leading up to this, he's talking about children and brutes, right? That is non-human animals. And he says, that divided and rebel mind, that distrust of a sentiment, because, sorry, our arithmetic has computed the strength and means opposed to our purpose. These have not. Their mind being whole, their eye is as yet unconquered. And when you look in their faces, their faces, we are disconcerted. Infancy conforms to nobody, all conform to it. So, right, so the like infancy or the animals, that is non human animals, um, also actually, as in Schelling, he even mentions plants, right, in that, in that place. But remember, he talks about the roses below my window. How they, right? So all these things are like um, um, before this initial separation. They don't have this divided and rebel mind, um, and their I is as yet unconquered. So I, I mean, this is pretty typical, right? That whenever you see the word I, you have to. Think whether it could be that eye, right? Their eye is as yet unconquered. Um, when we look in their faces, we are disconcerted. I don't know what that means. Disconcerted. I mean, it has like certainty. Concert, discon yeah, I don't know. Infancy conforms to nobody, right? That is so infancy doesn't have this finite activity that we have that is uh, conforming and conquered. <laughs> um, I don't know about here, oftentimes in Thoreau, you know, the, the so-called Boston transcendentalists actually lived in Concord. <laughs> I think that is Emerson and Thoreau lived in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, sometimes there's a pun on that as Thoreau. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. That probably is not on here. But um, so it's as yet, un, you know, unseparated, as yet unconquered. Um, and this is also what he calls on the next page the neutrality of boys. Neutrality. Right? Now terror is the is the Latin word for neither. So neutrality means like neitherness. The neitherness of voice means again like before this separation. Um, so there is this separation that, so to speak, is our problem, right? What he says on page fifty one is ah that he could return to. Oh, sorry, ah, that he could pass again into his neutrality. But um, having said that, like Schelling and Coleridge, he doesn't actually think that, that we, that what we need to do is go backwards. <laughs> um, right, so like going back to that thing about trust thyself on page 49. Um, Trust thyself, every heart, heart vibrates to that iron string, and then skipping a little bit. Great men have always done so, 
and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age. So great men have always confided themselves childlike <laughs> to the genius, the genius of their age. Um, I mean, it does mean don't try to be an ancient Roman in Congress. Right? Like, I mean, it, it, it does mean your age, but it also means their age. Like, you know, remember this, this opposition here is the origin of time. The question of how we should, how this infinite self should be related to this finite self is the question of what kind of time we should have. So I think the other day or their age is, or when he talks about the times, um, is a lot of times a way of saying, um, the right kind of temporality versus the wrong kind. Yes. So could this genius refer to person because he often talks about like single persons defining their age or what is what is just coming after them for quite a while so could he refer to that by the genius of their age oh you mean confide themselves to the genius of right so like find someone who is and trust them like we should trust him that are reading it um I admit that the words will bear that sense. I'm not sure how to attribute them in that sense to Emerson. Uh, I mean, because um, well, I mean, I guess I would put it this way, that if the, the genius of their age, whether it means the, you know, the dark unknown force that, that, that is infinite. And in so uh, like in some ways, not more me than it is you or whatever, or whether it means some individual that who's, who's a genius, like let's say Emerson, <laughs> so like you know whichever one it means the important thing is it has to be of their age right like the, the great men would confide themselves to something that isn't theirs um so uh um so it, so it doesn't mean uh, go find the person everyone says is a genius and do what they say or something like that, right? Um, that, that won't work. That's convention. Oh. Um, um, I mean, maybe, you know, I should read the other thing I was going to read, which is um, um, just farther down in the same paragraph. Um, right? So, great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age. And then um, um, continues betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And then the next sentence is, and we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors. So 
right? I mean, we, that is, I mean, who's included in that we? Well, in a sense, that's everyone. We are now men, right? That is, we're not infants anymore. <laughs> And um, we have to find a way to be child-like um, while remaining men <laughs> or women. Well, actually, Emerson sometimes does say, or women, sometimes. Um, and on the other hand, we'll see that Margaret Fuller oftentimes just says men. <laughs> um, but, uh, but he doesn't hear it, he really says men. Right. So anyway, um, uh, in a way that makes it worse, right? Like sometimes he knows enough to put it, puts it in, <laughs> but other times he doesn't. <laughs> but in any case, um, I mean, of course, in context, it's true. It means men versus boys, right? It doesn't mean men versus women, but nevertheless. So. Um, uh, Right, so so you know, like that problem of how to be childlike without being a minor protected in a corner or whatever, obviously can't be solved by um, finding someone else and letting them decide things for you. It can only be it can only be solved as he said in that sentence in between, by learning that the absolutely trustworthy thing is seated in your heart. Right? So, um, um, uh, what else was I, I'm sorry, something else I was gonna say. But well, why should we trust him? Why should we trust Emerson? Well, you know, So we should just decide whether we trust him or not. Do you want me to give you an answer as me or as Emerson? <laughs> because I don't know how to answer as Emerson. Right. I mean, I, you know, he says, so when he says, he doesn't exactly say, I don't care if I'm misunderstood, but he says to be great is to be misunderstood. Why is it so bad to be misunderstood? He's saying like, he doesn't mind if we don't trust him. If we don't trust him, we won't understand him. <laughs> um, you know, so if you ask why should we trust you, you say, no, I didn't tell you to trust me. <laughs> right? Um, but you know, if you ask me why we should trust him, I mean, this question can be asked about basically every industry philosophy. Right. So yeah. is this like a the first like contradiction in like or one contradiction in him like he's saying that you should only trust what you what the inner genius makes you think and then he writes his book about that so that I can be there. Well but you know I mean that's exactly I, I think that's getting to why he writes in this style. Yes everyone can read the book. But you, but you can't understand it unless it's the same thing. Wittgenstein says this at the beginning of the Tractatus, I think. And that this is the introduction of the Tractatus, right? Where he says um, that uh, um, this will perhaps be only only be understood by people who have had similar thoughts before. <laughs> and then he says towards the end that he doesn't care whether anyone has had these thoughts before. <laughs> Which, if you put them together, equals he doesn't care whether anyone understands. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, uh, meaning, he doesn't care, meaning, like, um, um, what does he say at some point in the essay? A great man is coming to my house for dinner. I will not think how to please him. I want him to want to please me. <laughs> right? Like he's not gonna court you. 
But and, but 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 he can't because, like you're saying, it would be a contradiction. Yeah. Right. It would be so he he he's offering you something that you know, if you can find yourself trusting it and confiding in it, then it will be yours. I, so, I mean, that's I guess that's the best thing I can say about that. Um, um, but it's not that different from an issue you find in the right, like let's say in reading Descartes' Meditations. You know, like Descartes famously doesn't prove that other minds exist anywhere in the meditation. He's right, he proves that bodies exist. So what's how is it going to prove that other minds exist? Well, if anyone's reading it, other minds exist. <laughs> and if anyone's reading it, the argument proves for them that they exist. But if no one's reading it, it doesn't prove anything. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't prove uh, it's not like the fifth meditation proof of the existence of God, the ontological argument, which is supposed to prove from nowhere that God necessarily exists, whether I've ever thought of him or not, whether, you know, right? Whereas, but, but the, the cognitive argument doesn't prove that any particular person exists. It only proves that you exist if you read it and understand it. So Descartes has like sent it out as a test. This is the way of telling whether there's anyone out there. <laughs> Right. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's a philosopher who's seemingly much more straightforward than um, than Emerson. And yet, if, I think if you look into it carefully, you'll see the same type of thing going on. Sorry, I have to put this question. Um, I mean, then you have to ask, well, you know, why doesn't Emerson write like Descartes? Or why doesn't Descartes write like Emerson? <laughs> I, you know, neither of them write in the obvious way that you might expect. Right, I mean, Descartes um, actually, in the objections and replies, he got questions about that. Why didn't you write? I mean, this would have been anachronistic, but you could put it this way: Why didn't you write like Spinoza? <laughs> uh, you know, shouldn't you have just started with axioms or whatever? Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer to the question or just some free association based on the question, but that's the second. All right. So, um, um, right. So, so, so that, you know, what's supposed to solve our problem here is a kind of self relationship, only instead of, um, Self knowledge, it's self reliance. Right? In Coleridge, this problem is supposed to be solved by self knowledge in a higher power or something like that. In Emerson, it's supposed to be solved, solved by self reliance, right? Confiding in yourself, like having faith in yourself. Um, um, so, uh, when we have faith in ourselves, we are original, original, but like the origin that comes after rather than the origin that came before. <laughs> when we have, when we trust ourselves and have faith in ourselves, we're original. And when we, um, don't rely on ourselves when we conform instead of being original. Um, that's when we feel shame. So, um, somehow shame is coming in here where, like, Coleridge would put remorse. Um, why am I saying that? So, so most of the things I'm reading are from towards the beginning at the moment. But so going back to page 48, um, in every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. 
Um, they teach us to abide by our spouse. So this is actually another part of the answer to your earlier question, I guess. They teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good humored inflexibility, then most when the whole cry of voices is on the other side. Else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time, and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. Right, so that, that alternative to originality and trusting yourself is in that case, yes, you'll have to take it's still your opinion, but you'll have to but, but you'll have to take it with shame from another. Um, so um, so we can be original or we can not be original. Now, um, this is a case where something like a um, inconsistency seems to come up, right? Like for example, on page 59, he says, um, I suppose no man can violate his nature. Right, so you might think, if, if I can't violate my own nature, how can I not be original? Um, but that actually should be an easy contradiction to resolve, so to speak, because that's the same contradiction we saw in Leibniz. <laughs> I mean, that is when I described the Leibniz, you know, the Leibniz in this course, but, and, and therefore in Sheldon, right? Like, um, um, how can I fail to do what I should? Well, I can't really fail to do what I should. <laughs> this is Leibniz's answer now, right? Um, but due to the limits of my self-knowledge, I can fail to do what, it, what I think I should. And when that happens, someone else, like another monad, is going to represent more clearly than I do the reasons for what I did. And that other monad will be dominate my monad. It will be the master and I'll be the slave. Um, so, or as Emerson says, this is on page 60. Um, there it is. Your genuine action will explain itself and will explain your other genuine actions. Your conformity explains nothing. Um, right? That's saying, again, just as Leibniz would say, that when I'm, um, when I'm acting freely, when I'm doing what I should in the sense that applies to a rational being, it's when I am representing clearly, explaining clearly the reasons why this is the next action that has to happen. When I'm not, someone else is, is, is explaining it instead. And that's, you know, um, so that uh, in Leibniz and in Schelling and Coleridge, I guess, is, the explanation of sin, right? It's the possibility of sin is due to a lack of self knowledge. So, um, and therefore the possibility of remorse as opposed to mere regret, as Coleridge puts it, is due to this lack of self knowledge. The possibility that I won't be original and won't explain myself, but I'll allow others something else to explain me. So, um, but in Emerson, um, self-trust, once again, replaces self-knowledge. And it's trust, what are you trusting in here exactly? You're trusting in your own power. You're trusting in your own power to, um, um, 
to be unconquered, <laughs> right? To uh, to impose your own form on things rather than meet things and try to conform to them. Um, this is here's another quote from page forty nine. I feel like I've read almost all, all of page forty nine at this point, but. Um, uh, oh, it's on page 48. The power which resides in him is new in nature. And none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. Not for, so, and I mean, so here's like a typical problem we have reading Emerson, or at least that I have. The next sentence doesn't, it's the connection to what he just said is unclear. The next sentence is, not for nothing, one face, one character, one fact makes such impression on him and another none. Like, what does that have to do with the fact that the power that resides in me is new in nature, and I don't know, and no one knows what I can do until I try? Well, so what it what it has to do is, so here's the next sentence. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. <laughs> right? These things go together because he's thinking of violence when he writes these things. <laughs> so, um, he, right, he's 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 saying that um, um, uh, this is the equivalence of what Leibniz is saying. My, my monad, so to speak, has been put in the exact place where uh, where I can do whatever I have the power to do, and we'll find out. <laughs> Um, how much power I have when I do it. Um, and um, um, and the trust that I have the power, which is the thing that's needed to right? So again, instead of clarity, what's needed here is a kind of trust, the trust that I have the power, right? Like what these infants and animals and plants don't do is calculate the arithmetic of the opposing forces. And, and realize that they can't achieve their purpose. They just go ahead. Right? That's, that's what I need in order to have the power. I need to trust that I have the power. Um, and um, um, And so that trust is what he calls courage. Right, the trust in the face of obstacles that you have the power to overcome them is courage, and um, if you so, what happens? What we can say about the person who doesn't have that trust and therefore doesn't manage to do um, what they think they want to do, or something like that, um, is not that that person is sinning, but that that person is a coward and they should be ashamed, right? And so the end of this passage, which is on page 49, um, we but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it be faithfully imparted, but God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. Um, so, I mean, um, like on the one hand, I'm, I'm emphasizing how power and courage and trust have come in here to kind of like replace knowledge and um, and morality 
Um, so, um, and you know, obviously, I'm doing that. Well, first of all, I mean, it is in the text, but I'm, I'm emphasizing it because I, you know we know we're headed for Nietzsche, so <laughs> it's um, nice to see that this that a change is happening here. Um, but on the other hand, like I wouldn't want to overemphasize this, you know, like what this change represents. I mean, because and, and this is this is something that's always tricky in the history of philosophy, like. Um, you know, you think you've put your finger on what the difference between A and B is, but then if you think about it harder, you realize you can reinterpret A so they're really funny. <laughs> but, you know, so because actually Leibniz himself identifies pow clarity with power. <laughs> I mean, it kind of works the other way around, but I'm not sure how much difference that, like, what does that mean that it works the other way around? Right, but Leibniz says, you know, one monad can't act on another. So, in what sense do I say that this one is active and this one is this one is active and this one is passive? And the answer is because this one represents this one better than vice versa. So, um, and therefore, as I think I explained before, therefore, like this one has to do what it does in order for God to like satisfy the claim that this one is making. This one clearly claims that something is going to do this, and therefore something has to do this. <laughs> it's no, there's no direct causation, but it's a moral claim against God, and that's why it says that's the only kind of power that finite things have um, over each other anyway. So, um, so already in Leibniz, the issue is a little bit blurred, and certainly by the time we get to Coleridge, um, and I think there's something like this in Schelling too, although I have to admit that that part of Schelling, I still feel like I don't understand the transition to the practical philosophy as well as I should. But, um, but remember, there was that thing in Coleridge about, you know, if I say, um, well, why not think that, um, this impression of freedom that we have is illusory. And Coleridge says, you may assume that. <laughs> um, uh, imply it, but you shouldn't. <laughs> it's a practical question, right? So, um, so that like the self-knowledge that Coleridge is demanding at that point is um, it's a kind of knowledge, but it's but it's really an act of will that's involved in, in knowing it correctly. Yeah. So if Emerson is preaching sacred lights, <laughs> what place is there for God in the system? Is the sacred light based on God? Like that's why you can do it? Because there's a piece of ceremony. Well, it's, so I'm uh, hopefully going to talk more in uh, towards the end about uh, what he's saying about religion here. But I mean, it's um, 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 I mean, on one level, like again, you could ask the same question in Leibniz. The monad. Uh, uh, under its own power expresses its own nature, and that's what it's supposed to do, and that's all it does. What room is there for God? Um, but the monad does that because the monad is an expression of a divine idea. And it's an expression of a divine idea that's in harmony with the expressions of other divine ideas that make up a world. It's the best world. <laughs> so now, I mean, I, I wouldn't like try to transfer that solution like lock, stock, and barrel to Emerson, but it's but he is definitely still in that same universe of of thoughts, right? To like because he also talks about us expressing a divine idea. Right? I think that was in the passage I just read. Um, we but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. So, um, 
Um, so I think in Emerson and Coleridge, maybe less so in Shelley, but in Emerson and in Coleridge, we still have the thought that um, when we talk about God, we're talking about the um, um, the infinite harmony that's that's represented in infinitely many different ways by it, by individuals. Um, and it's uh, so that's the wolf, right? <laughs> I, you know, um, I mean, it's uh, um, yeah, is that, I mean, is that enough for the, for the time being? Because I want to say something, because he obviously disagrees with Coleridge in some big way about religion, so you have to get to that, but. Uh, but, but very broadly, it is in the same, you know, like the world is the world is full of God and everything represents God. Um, um, and so therefore, following your own nature is following the divine command, you know, et cetera. Um, so uh, okay, so anyway, getting back to uh, let's see, pick up one um, Right, so I guess, um, so, so that was, that, what I just said was the purpose of kind of blurring the distinction a little bit, but nevertheless, the distinction is somewhere in that area, and it has um, a really, uh, uh, drastic effect on um, how you understand this thing that Schelling, in a rather relatively mild way, says, and that Coleridge, in a stronger way, says that um, that sin, or you know, in this case, like cowardice or like failure to express your nature. Um, is um, uh, shows itself in the fact that the law is alien to you, that the law appears to you as a law. And remember, I was saying that 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 this seems to uh, this, especially the way Coleridge understands it, it seems to be putting him, and he recognizes it seems to be putting him in danger of being considered an anti -Nomian. right? Someone who thinks that, you know, you should ignore the law, meaning the moral law is how he would understand it, or even that you should deliberately violate it. <laughs> um, so Emerson is in the same area and is facing the same issue, but, um his uh denial is less strong i guess so this is on page 73 the populace think that your rejection of popular standards is a rejection of all standard and mere antinomianism and the bold sensualist will use the name of philosophy to gild his crimes but the law of consciousness abides so, um, so first of all, right, he's, he's acknowledging that this looks like follow, you know, express your own nature. Um, don't let anyone else tell you what to do. Uh, it looks like this could be aimed against morality. Um, and I guess I don't need to say that, that, that there's a question like this about Nietzsche. <laughs> right? So, um, or, you know, so, uh, I mean, I guess the problem when you get to Nietzsche is Nietzsche won't deny it at all. <laughs> right? And then it's hard to know how to deal with that. <laughs> but, um, but so in the case of Emerson, I mean, he is denying it, but he's, you know, and so like he does recognize a kind of 
I mean, it's the sensualists, the bold sensualists. I guess we're talking about so-called sexual immorality here. Hedonism? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, hedonism, more generally speaking. I guess. Yeah. So anyway, like um, someone. So I mean, here, I mean, like here's what's going on with the bold sensualists. The bold sensualist is really immersed in this, right? It's, it's the hedonism is really a form of conformism or adaptation. Right, you're like doing whatever you can to, to get those pleasant stimuli coming in. Right, so it's really the opposite of what Emerson is talking about. But he admits that um, you could do that and use his words to justify it. Um, but he says, nevertheless, the law of consciousness abides, um, meaning that yes. Uh, the bold sensualist can do that, but they're but they're lying. It's not right. That's not the law of consciousness. Um, but why do I say this is um, um, a weaker kind of denial? Well, I mean, um, uh, not being a hedonist doesn't necessarily imply being what we would normally think of as moral. <laughs> um, and when he gets to the question whether this law of consciousness is uh, um, whether this isn't an evasion of morality of some other kind, what he says is this is on page 74. If anyone imagines that this law is lax, let him keep its commandment one day. Meaning that it requires power <laughs> to keep this law. It doesn't exactly show that it requires morality. So, right? He's saying it's hard. Don't think that, right? But the sensualist is doing these easy. Right, this, because the sensualist again is just adapting to. So, what what the true self reliant person is doing is hard. It requires power. You can't just. It's not like you can't just say, um, you know, I'm tired of this morality stuff. It's too hard. From now on, I'm going to be self reliant. Uh, right? That would be like in Nietzschean terms, saying, you know, I'm tired of this morality thing. From now on, I'm going to be an Ubermensch. <laughs> like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Just try. You can't do it, right? So, um, um, so that seems suspicious. And then to make it worse, uh, some of the things he says in the essay really don't sound very moral, right? Like, so there's this. This is one of the most um, extreme and famous ones um, where he talks about the philanthropist who wants him to give money for various causes to improve people's situation. And he ends up saying, though I confess with shame, I sometimes succumb and give the dollar. It is a wicked dollar, which by and by I shall have the manhood to withhold. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know how and don't really want to try to, like, defend the thesis that Emerson is really a good guy after all. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, uh, oh. People seem to have liked them, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, and despite what he says about abolitionism here, he was an abolitionist, <laughs> you know. Um, he, um, so um, in other words, it's not like as if we were talking about Heidegger, where I, you know, where I have to say, oh, and by the way, 
<laughs> right. So it's, um, but on the other hand, you know, I can't say that's an irrelevant question, but I, but I don't know exactly how to get into it or how to make it relevant. But what I do want to talk about is like, so what is Emerson thinking when he says something like that? Why say something like that? It's so shocking. Um, um, so I think what's going on here, to get back to the details of this picture, or maybe this picture that I drew where you can't see it, where I was talking about inversion. Well, I guess I can put it in here, right? So like the difference is um, there's some kind of change between Coleridge and Emerson in the way the infinite self ought to create a boundary or in other words, to create time, right? Again, like there's there's two ways of creating time. There's this day and the other day. <laughs> um, and uh, and Emerson thinks one of the ways is the wrong way, or one of the ways of reacting to it as the infinite self is wrong. I'm not sure exactly how to put this. But anyway, like it doesn't seem like this aversion. It seems like this aversion is different from or a stronger version of. Let's see. Stronger version of what Forge is calling reflection. Um, and that, um, or uh, maybe I should say that aversion and reflection are both types of revolution and reversion. Reversion. This, right? Revolution means like spinning around. Reversion means turn back. Conversion means turning around. It, the conversion is a Christian term for what happens when you, you know, lose the finite world and gain your soul or something like that. Reversion is the platonic term and it, for what happens when you're in the cave and the philosopher comes and unchains you and turns you around. <laughs> That's, um, so like, um, the question is, what's the right way of doing this? Maybe? So maybe I should say, like, what's the right attitude towards time? What's the right way of philosophically having time? Something like that. Um, and um, I think he's somehow talking about this on page 74 again, where he says, um, um, Actually, it starts on page 73 at the bottom. You may fulfill your round of duties by clearing yourself in the direct or in the reflex way. Consider whether you have satisfied your relations to father, mother, cousin, neighbor, town, cat, and dog. <laughs> that list is a great effect, right? Because you start off thinking, yeah, this is part of the heart of morality what I owe to my father and mother, cousin, neighbor, town, cat, and dog. <laughs> and now you start to see how, like, if this is the test you're using, you're like dispersing yourself or, you know, somehow losing your, um, allowing your eye to be conquered. Because <laughs> um, this list is going to continue indefinitely fish, a plant, right? So um, um, whether any of these can upbraid you, that's the reflex test, right? So reflex I'm taking to be some kind of allusion to the talk in Coleridge and Schelling and others about reflection. This is the reflex test. Consider, uh, sorry, um, but I also neglect this reflex standard and absolve me to myself. 
solve means to make absolute. I can resolve me to myself. Um, um, I have my own stern claims of perfect circle. So I, I take it that somehow what he's calling aversion um, is um, a way of rejecting this conformity that uh, um, somehow doesn't rely on the results of the conformity. Now, I mean, you might say, well, like who said it can rely on the results of the conformity? But, you know, I mean, the way this happens, well, the easiest case to explain is Sheldon, right? Like the way this happens in Sheldon, ultimately, is that the work of artistic genius is a sensible thing, which is suitable to represent the infinite, right? So, so the way I get, you know, back to the infinite, so to speak, is to see my reflection in this sensible thing, and that sends me here. But the aversion somehow, like, doesn't use this thing, it just rejects it. Um, now, I mean, does that mean, so now do we have Gnosticism? Is he saying, oh, the sensible world is evil and you need to turn away from it? Um, you know, time is evil and you need to return to the realm of the eternal or something like that. Um, well, uh, he's not, I think it's pretty clear he's not saying that. I mean, that's not the way he talks about nature. Right? Um, unlike Coleridge, he doesn't have anything about how this world is corrupt and opposed to our purposes or something like that. But I think, so the question is, like, I guess you could put it this way, how does the self still establish a boundary in itself and yet um, um, not use that boundary for the purpose of returning to itself? Not be reflected from that boundary. And, but I don't know how to explain exactly why this is it, but I think that, but the answer is, I mean, I guess I could explain why Coleridge might have to admit that this is a possible way to go. The answer is that the self has to elect which what will be its own and what won't. So, um, so the 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 self decides what to ex what to make its own out of the world, and that's how it establishes the boundary. So the, the world isn't doing it to it. That would be reflection, right? Rather, the, the self is excluding what it excludes and keeping what it keeps. Um, and that's why he says, for example, are they my poor? If they're not my poor, they're not the elect. Yeah, yeah. So even if he does self elect something to be of itself or to, is that still a version or is just the other part a version? Yeah, I I don't know if I've drawn this picture correctly. What the turning away I mean it's a version of conformity. It's turning it backwards. Maybe really the picture should be that I do it this way. Like, you know, that I, I make this boundary my own. Then I don't know how to draw the line that does this, but somehow, right? That's what the turning around is. A version. Yeah, because he doesn't say a version from conformity, he says a version of conformity, I think. 
self-reliance is its aversion. So make the decision that I will push this as my own or not yeah. is aversion from conformity. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I mean, again, like, I think I'm falling into the temptation of doing what I said I wouldn't and trying to erect a consistent system here. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe we can't, maybe we can't exactly decide how this picture should be drawn. Um, but, uh, but at least somehow those two are supposed to be expressions of the same principle that we need here is a version, not reflection, and that the boundary in the world has to be my boundary of the things between the things that I recognize as my own and confide in as my own and the things that I don't. So, I mean, I think that's, uh, um, I think that's what he means when he says on page 53. So this is back when he's talking to the abolitionists or and it's after that part. Um, Your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is none. <laughs> um, right? I mean, in context, that sounds like it means, oh yeah, here it is. It's right after he says, rough and graceless would be such greeting. That is what he imagined saying to the abolitionists. And then he says, you know, but truth is handsomer than the affectation of love. Your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is not. So, like in context, it sounds like it means your goodness should be kind of rough, right? It should be like sharp, you know. But I think, although, uh, I mean, I guess he does mean that, but he also means your goodness has to have an edge, or else it is not. Um, so, uh, and I think like that spirit is behind some of the not only shocking but seemingly mutually contradictory things he says in various parts of the essay. So right, like this one on page 53, he says, imagine saying to the abolitionist, go love thy infant, love thy woodchopper, have that grace, and never varnish your hard, uncharitable ambition with this incredible tenderness for black folk, folk a thousand miles off. But later on, he advises the reader to say, Oh, father, oh, mother, this, so that was on page 53, and this, oh, father, oh, mother, is on page 72. Did I only read like, <laughs> I feel like all my quotes are from like the same four pages. <laughs> what happened in the rest of this? <laughs> well, I don't know. Anyway, um, that's not true. I had one quote from page 60, but. Um, I should probably go back and read those parts in between. But anyway, say to them, oh father, oh mother, oh wife, oh brother, oh friend, I have lived with you after appearances hitherto. Henceforward, I am the truth. The truth. <laughs> I belong to the truth, right? I cannot break myself any longer for you or you. I will not hide my tastes or aversions. There's that word again. I'm skipping some parts here, but if you are true, but not in the same truth with me, cleave to your companions. I will seek my own. Right? So like I said, those sound kind of like contradictory pieces of advice, right? Like to the, to the abolitionist, he says, um, what's your business, you know, with this ambition you have to rescue these people thousands of miles away? Pay attention to your family and your friends and your employees and whatever. But then later on, he says, um, go to your, your family and your friends and your employees and say, um, you know what, uh, like, I just have to devote myself to the truth now. And if it's not your truth, tough luck. <laughs> right? So, but, um, so, I mean, they are kind of contradictory, right? Like, there, there are things maybe he would say in a different mood or something like that. We'll see that, um, in uh, nature, he talks a lot about the sequence of moods and what that means. 
but you know, I think you would say in a different mood or something like that, but they do still express the same principle that your goodness must have an edge. <laughs> you have to draw a line. Um, um, and again, that edge is like, so Emerson not replacing God, I don't think, but representing God is um, enacting, and this is why I said Coleridge would have to agree that this is a possibility that you can consider here, is enacting some version of God's distinction between the elect and the reprobate. <laughs> um, right, that's why he says that the greeting to the abolitionists would be rough and graceless. He's not granting the abolitionist grace. Any talks to him this way. All right, it looks like I'm out of time. Maybe I'll, I didn't get to talking about what he's saying about symbols and especially religious symbols, which is pretty important to discussing his relationship to Coleridge. But I guess I'll talk about that beginning next time. So, so I will see you then. Thank you for coming, those who came. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching those in Interland.